Welcome back to The Path to Happiness. I'm your host, Dr. Tyler Hendricks. There are several stories and many prophecies of the destruction of the world in the Bible, so-called destruction of the world. The last days came in Noah's time, as well as in Jesus' lifetime. Chapter 6, 13, chapter 6, verse 13 in Genesis records the end of the world predicted to take place during Noah's lifetime. In fact, God annihilated the human race after 1600 years of sinful history, which was rooted in Satan through the flood. God wanted to create a family. That was what was going on. He wanted to create one family centered on Noah, who had undying faith in God, and to create a world centered on, on God. But as we will study in greater detail later, due to the mistake of Ham, the second son of Noah, that goal was not fully realized. The restoration plan centered on Noah did not succeed. But God's desire for complete restoration is absolute and unchanging. So he selected the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and prepared a foundation of faith whereupon Jesus could be sent. Jesus came also to destroy the world centered on Satan and to restore an ideal world centered on God. So the last days also took place during Jesus' time. But due to the lack of faith in Jesus, it again was not fulfilled. Jesus said that he came to light a fire on the earth. He said, I wish that it were already kindled. But the plan was postponed to the second coming. Jesus, who died on the cross bearing the pain of crucifixion, was able to accomplish spiritual restoration. Thus, God planned a second coming in order to accomplish the restoration of the physical body. And so Matthew 24 and 2 Peter and Revelation, they all prophesy more natural catastrophes at the second coming. Based on this record, what, how can we interpret, interpret the meaning of the last days? Human history is God's history of restoration. Therefore, the last days is when this world that is centered on Satan will transition into a God-centered world where the three great blessings are fulfilled. So the last days can be defined as the transition period where the world centered on Satan transitions into the original ideal world centered on God. In other words, it is a period where hell on earth changes into heaven on earth. In the East, it is called the dawn of civilization. During this time, the old era of inequality, restriction, disharmony, conflict, sadness, and grief transitions into a new era of equality, freedom, harmony, unity, and happiness. Thus, it is not a time to fear natural catastrophes, as believed by some Christian followers based on the literal interpretation of some, some scriptures. It is a time, rather, of joy and happiness long desired by God and by humankind because the original ideal of creation will be realized. So let us study the records in the Bible that teach about the last days from a historical perspective. Some verses in the Bible prophesy the destruction of heaven and earth. For example, 2 Peter 3.12, as, as in Genesis 6.13, also Revelation 21.1, and again in 2 Peter 3.13, many, Judges 66, many state something along these lines, as in 2 Peter 3.12. You expect and eagerly desire the coming of the day of God, in which the heavens, being tested by fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements, when set on fire, shall melt. It also talks about the sun and the moon and the stars crashing down into the earth, destroying this world. Well, will the world really burn up in the last days? D. 
Genesis 6.13 stated that the earth would be destroyed and annihilated during Noah's life, but it wasn't destroyed. Ecclesiastes 1.4 states, Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. So the Bible gives a different picture in other verses. Similarly, Psalm 69.35-36 says, For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah, and his servants shall live there and possess it, and the children of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall live in it. We can infer from many verses like this that the earth is eternal. God built to last. Thus, we can conclude that the earth will not be destroyed literally in the last days. The heaven and earth will be destroyed and a new earth will be created is metaphorical. It does have meaning. The Bible is telling the truth, but we just have to interpret it with the right perspective. When a country is destroyed, it implies that the central power of the country is overthrown and a new nation is built. It implies a new sovereignty will rule. Likewise, the destruction of heaven and earth means that the central power controlling the earth, Satan, will be destroyed and a new heaven and new earth will be established, meaning a God-centered sovereignty centered on Jesus will be restored. Also, as stated in 2 Peter, the heavens and earth will be judged by fire. Will there really be a judgment by fire in the last days? In Malachi 4.1, the Lord said that he would return and judge with fire. And in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, 49, Jesus said he came to cast a fire on the earth. But in reality, there's no evidence or even legends that Jesus went around lighting fires. It cannot be denied that these words are metaphorical. The meaning is easy to understand. The epistle of James 3.6 states that the tongue is a fire. And in the book of Jeremiah 23.29 it says, Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Therefore, judgment by fire means judgment by the word of God, spoken by the tongue of the prophet. We are judged by God's word. As Jesus said in John 12, 48, the one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as his judge. In addition, the expression, another parable, that the dead will rise from the graves in the last days, it's also a statement that is easily misinterpreted. Will corpses really rise from the grave? In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, 52, it was reported that at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints that had fallen asleep were raised. After the resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, prophesied, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds, together with them, to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah! And so, we will be with the Lord forever. But it doesn't mean that the decomposed bodies of the believers will rise up, if the saints of the Old Testament really rose out of the graves and entered the, the temple in Jerusalem, certainly many people would have witnessed it and there would have been written records of it. It would have proved for many Jews, since they were already familiar with Jesus' claim that he was the Messiah, that it was all true. Christianity in the beginning would have spread that news everywhere. But it's not, it wasn't spread, it was just a few people who saw that happened it was with their spiritual eyes. There's no historical record. The risen saints were seen only spiritually by believers, and just for a brief period. 
We'll discuss later what was going on with these appearances because it's very important. And the prophecy of rising into the air to meet the Lord. These are very important if we understand them properly. And there's another very interesting verse uh, that says, The sun and the moon will turn dark and the stars shall fall from the sky. Matthew 24. Jesus said that in the last days. Now, if the sun and the moon go out and the stars fall to the earth, which makes no sense anyway, the existence of life on earth would become impossible. But so we need to understand the meaning of sun and moon and stars here in the Bible. What's the biblical meaning? The verse Genesis 37 9 tells us the meaning of this prophecy. It presents the dream that Joseph had, the 11th among the 12 sons of Jacob. In it, it records that Joseph dreams again and tells his brothers that the sun and the moon and the 11 stars asked uh, them all to bow down to him. And when he told his dream to his father and his brothers, the father rebuked him and said, am I and your mother and your brothers really going to lay down on the ground and bow to you? So, which means that Jacob knew the meaning of the sun was the father, the moon was the mother, and the stars were his, his siblings. Now, later, Joseph took the position of prime minister in Egypt, and his dream came true when his parents and his brothers bowed down to him. But from this verse, Jacob states that the sun and the moon symbolize the father and mother, and the stars symbolize the children. So in the Old Testament, the sun was Moses, and the moon was the law, and the, and the uh, stars, the children, were the children of Israel, the 12 tribes. And when Jesus and the Holy Spirit and Christian believers also, Jesus is the sun, the Holy Spirit is the moon. Christian believers are the, the stars, the children. And the gospel was a brighter light than the law of Moses. And so when Jesus came, Moses and the law lost their light symbolically. The children of Israel, when they rejected Jesus, fell from heaven because they didn't receive that new light. So the Bible indicates that when Jesus comes back again and gives his new truth, the words he delivers, delivered at the first coming will go through the exact same process. They will lose their light. They're still shining, but a much greater light. Jesus will bring a much greater light at the second coming that will make, by comparison, the gospel lose its light. By mentioning Jesus saying that the stars would fall from heaven, he was warning the Christians that they will fall from heaven if they fail to receive the new light that he is going to bring. As illustrated earlier, the Bible signifies the last days in metaphor and symbol, and there will be no literal destruction. The last days are the last days of evil, the last days of the satanic realm, and the dawn of an era of hope, an era of joy. It is the end of the old era and the beginning of a new era. Human beings who are embedded in this old era are going to suffer from anxiety, uncertainty, and fear due to the lack of a guiding truth and will live in fear due to external conflicts and tyranny. At this historical point of transition, we each have to start looking for the central point of God's new history for Moses, for Jesus, for the Lamb of God. The providence of the new era does not grow from the total dissolution of the old era. It takes root in the circumstances of the last days of the old era, and it grows slowly. This actually brings it into conflict with the old era. It is akin to the last days of the Old Testament era when Jesus, who arrived as the central figure of the new providence, was seen as a heretic by the guardians of the old era. The people finally sent him to the cross. 
Therefore, Jesus said, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. We are now in the last days of the New Testament era. It means it is time for the arrival of Jesus Christ. After his advent, he will provide us with the new expression of truth, a blueprint to build a new heaven and new earth and restore God's purpose of creation. At such a transitional point in history, the ones who are embedded in the old era will go through judgment, as did the people of the Old Testament era. Hence, for the ones who are facing the last days, more than anything, it is a time to realize the divinity deep inside through prayer with a humble heart. Do not cling to conventional notions, but prepare to respond to God's new revelation. When Jesus came, he was the Son of God and Messiah who ministered and taught, but no one truly recognized him. In the last days, the Messiah comes, but will you recognize him? It is imperative to find the new truth that will guide the new era. I hope all of you can find this new truth, this word of the happy era, and walk hand in hand on the path of true resurrection. Thank you for your kind attention, and may you consider these ideas thoughtfully as you continue in your studies.